Hello, adventurers. I want to take a moment to tell you that all our content can now be found uninterrupted and commercial-free on Apollo Plus. Apollo Plus is a subscription-based service that enhances your audio fiction experience with ad-free access to your favorite shows and exclusive content, while at the same time supporting us all as creators to keep bringing you quality content. Please take a moment to check out Apollo Plus at apollopods.com or download the app in your Google or Apple app stores. Again, that's Apollo Plus, your new home for quality audio fiction. Listener's warning. This episode of Dawn of Dragons deals with darker story elements that may be comfortable for some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Dawn of Dragons, Season 2, Episode 7, A Song in the Dream. (laughs) The monkey chirped from his shoulder, both happy for their freedom and in worried anticipation of their liberators. Not completely trusting, it shrieked at Cordelia when she tried to come near. Abu does not like you. I'm sorry. The cold voice of the tall elf was quiet and hushed. He looked like the rest of the Viridian elves, Vix noted. Although he was much taller, standing almost seven feet, and most elves residing at five. His white hair made him look closer to these deep elves, except for his plum-colored eyes. You are taller than most, and your hair and eyes are not common to our people. Are you from this place? The elf known as Erlin turned to Vix and coolly regarded his question. No one is truly from here. I found that to be true in my time imprisoned, though many come to visit eventually. Thank you again. I have no idea how many years have passed that I've been trapped in that cage. Where are you from? Benedict asked. Erlin paused. I... I was a sailor. My ship was the Nautilus. Our beloved Captain Dorito fell to a band of pirates to which I myself was imprisoned. Tortured. He stayed there comfortable in silence. And then looking away to the distant hallways in darkness. Bound and ended up here. I know not much else. Nearby, Zorin opened the chest he had hid behind. He easily picked the ancient lock, and the large, ornate brass clasp creaked from its post, freeing the lid. It was heavy and dense, but free of age and rot, despite the layer of dust. He peered inside. He saw an ornate rapier. Green and purple gems graced the sterling silver guard, and scabbard glinting in the light. He smiled as he lifted it out of its resting place. That's a gorgeous weapon, Zorin. It sure is. Zorin stared at Benedict for a moment, wondering where the voice came from. I... uh... uh... (laughs) Well, don't be stupid. Tell him thank you, silly. He looked down at the sword. The voice was coming from the sword. He quickly looked at Benedict. Yes, 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 yes. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it suits you. (laughs) See? We were meant to be together. Your friend even thinks so. (laughs) Did you you hear that? Hear what? Zorn raised an eyebrow, testing the waters of the conversation. A, A voice? Just us. He can't hear me, silly. (laughs) You sure you are okay? Benedict approached his friend cautiously. Uh, Maybe the air is getting to you. I I could... I'm fine. Benedict paused, his eyes raised in mock surprise at his friend's outburst. Oh, boy. Zane smiled, finding humor (laughs) in the situation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm I'm fine. Just... Just a bit weary. That... Thanks. He stumbled off to sit on the steps with his new blade. Benedict shook his head (laughs) with a chuckle. Okay, old friend. 
It's... it's okay. Scott Muir sat at his bedside thinking, looking out the window at the large underground city. The flames rumbled periodically from towering furnaces, sending plumes of fire and smoke rolling into the air. He thought of the marshal's face when they told her they had completed the journey and what they had found. She looked very disturbed by the news, though her voice carried the same stone-born strength he had come to expect of her. All of you get some rest. We meet here in the morning to discuss our king. She turned away from them, he noted. It seemed she had brushed a cheek. I fear this has had no effect on his condition. <sighs> Beyond noticing the rest of his friends were asleep and flopping back onto the bed, he closed his eyes. Scott Muir saw his father in front of the great forge hammer of their people. To his right was Thotmir, his brother. They were identical save for Thotmir's dark blue armor and dirty blonde beard he wore in a single, well-kept braid. Scott Muir never liked the feel of their traditional armor. Too restrictive. He was known as a boar's head fighter. A berserker who did better without being trapped in armor and was known for their ferocity. The ferocity of the wild boar in battle. They were also outcasts in polite dwarven society. He shouldn't be in this room. Sami, my brother, why are you here? Thotmir's eyes studied him uncomfortably. You left us. Now why do you return? Before Scottmere could reply, Thotmere raised a hand to silence him. It matters not for... He looked away and back at their father on the huge podium. For we need you not. Their father stood with his back turned to them. His long white beard braided in the center pulled neatly from the golden crown on his head. He set the jeweled hammer down on the anvil and turned to them. Yes, Scottmir. Do you know why you are here? Father, no, I... You are here because you need to collect and bring back the last of the six winds and an artifact that has been forgotten in time. You have found one of these. She sat in the chair, mending a seam on a white tunic. Zane is so hard on his clothes. <laughs> Mama, tell me about the dragons. Laura Hanna looked at her with a slightly tired expression. <sighs> oh, all right. She paused, then smiled, succumbing to the pleading voice of her child. What do you want to know? Their magic. Her voice changed. She felt control over this dream now, over this memory. No longer that eight-year-old child. Remember, dragon magic is powerful magic. A magic that can pass through time and over great distances. Magic weapons, in many ways, are forged from dragon magic, whether actually touched by the dragon's spirit or just mimicked. At its core, dragon magic can work wonders and may even upon its destruction or freeing, I've heard grant wishes. She stopped rocking and thought for a moment. Hmm. It's probably best dragons haven't been seen for so many years, my sweet Cordelia. He could smell the hot coals before he felt its warm, familiar heat. His hand was resting on a rough oak table where a four-inch red-eyed dragon turtle carved of pure mithril silver sat. great arm brought down the hammer to the red-hot iron, sending sparks scattering away. The deep voice resonated. What are you looking for, Benedict? An artifact of power. But that's all we know. <laughs> Erebus laughed as he's thrusted the iron back into the fire. I suppose the real question is, what do you really need? Benedict thought for a moment. Erebus taught him a solution wouldn't be found looking directly for it. Instead, he was to find a path or a tool and work towards it. A light. A light for this terrible darkness. Erebus nodded as he pulled out a raw, jagged iron rod 
from the table. You've always gone through life yearning for something bigger, but you've never found what you had within first, and then find what you are without. You walk towards the workbench. Take this iron. By itself, it seems strong. And it can do the job in most cases, I suppose. He shrugs. Then in one swift stroke, he comes down on it with the hammer, shattering the iron. <laughs> but under a different force, it's actually brittle. But if you work it in the smoke and fire, it becomes steel. He points at the hammer. He then walks over to Benedict, who then realizes how young and small he truly is, and how big Erebus seems. Smoke and fire are simple things, but they need to get inside the iron. You are this iron, but now you found the fire of the Night Lord, have you not? Benedict nodded a little, embarrassed at himself. Erebus patted his shoulder, smiling. <laughs> well then, Benedict. Maybe you've already found what you came for. In the morning, the group all had been sharing the majority of these stories with each other. Each of them in turn were entertained, if nothing more, by each other's company again. All save for Vix. <sighs> you all never cease to amaze me with your silly stories. He stated plainly, picking up a towel, leaving for the bathhouse. I'll return shortly. Then... We best get moving to Marshall Ironstone. She doesn't seem to be one who likes to wait. The group sat there in silence for a moment, thinking of his parting words. I dreamt of my family too. Oh, not as pleasant. Zorn sighed, knowing he couldn't keep it from them any longer. I saw a boy about ten years old sneaking in a room he should not be in. It was a room of oddities surrounding a desk. Brains in jars, small hideous creatures in jars with labels and unpronounceable names. It was me, but as if I was out of my body. On the central oak table there's a basketball shaped object covered with an embroidered cloth. The object seemed to slightly pulse in size as I approached it. It hissed at me, like steam from ice and boiling oil, and just as dangerous. As I raised the edge of the fabric, I saw a faint green light fading in and out, in and out, like the waves on the sea. I'd never seen the sea back then. Anyways, bands of script appeared in a bright gold contrasted against the green fog within. I wanted to reach in so badly. Tears streamed down my face as that voice became sweeter. Motherly, familiar. Come to my enemies. Let me whisper sweetness in your ears and cover you with kisses. Never. Footsteps in the hall broke my trance. I gasped and looked around sharply for an escape, but none could be found readily as the only way in or out was that hall which the footsteps were coming from. This was my father's office, and I was never allowed to be in my father's office. I saw a small table next to the cushioned bench used for reading or guests that he never had. I dove under it, hoping it was enough. With this, I can control dragons for you, as you do, my love. The boy, he is weak. The boy begins to sneak out of the room, but bumps the table leg, causing a small candle to rattle in its mooring. The giant man turns around, and as he spins, he notices the boy under the table. 
With a mighty arm, he flips the table up and out of the way, exposing him to the wrath of the much larger man. You! What have I told you about being in my study? Hey there. A call is heard from outside. Can Zorin come out and play? Go away, Zane! He booms towards the front door. Zorin can't play today! Then slowly, with a maniacal grin towards the boy, who knows if he even whimpers, he will just get more of the same, if not worse. He grits his teeth and vows he will never carry his father's name. <laughs> and all fades to black. Zane was staring at his friend. I... I remember that day. I'm sorry. He wrapped his arms around him. I'm not. He'll be the sorry one. Zorin brushed his eye briefly and looked at his best friend. Thanks, buddy. His eyes were gentle and calm as usual. Did you dream of anything? Nah, I was out. What about you, Jade? Jade thought for a moment while restringing her bow by the window. Yes, I had a dream. She thought gazing outside across the dark water. But I assure you it was of no importance. It was of another time. Another life. Cordelia raised an eyebrow, but quickly smiled. Well, let's get moving. The marshal's waiting for us. As they all gathered their things, Jade remembered more of her dream. A dream of dear friends from a long time ago. They're all poised on a ridge, astride six war horses overlooking a huge barbarian army in the green valley below. Their shouts and jeers are muffled at this distance by the gentle breeze it was spring, she remembers. She sees the village in flames behind the raiders, her keen nose filling with the iron and smoke of the slaughter below. She notices the raven-haired mage at her right turn away as they see a few knights' bodies are being paraded around by them. They're celebrating the slaughter they all came to atone for. Is it just us then? A knight states plainly, turning her head to the black-haired leader. Her dirty blonde hair hung gently to the shoulder, cut in a short style to ensure mobility in the heavy plate encasing her torso, a style all but Jade and the mage were wearing. The knight carried a polearm with a swooping blade on one end. It was a glaive, Jade remembered. Couldn't remember her name, or any of their names for that matter, just that this was her tribe her family. Next to the mage, a tall, honey-haired man drew his long sword, a sword that looked like the emblem of the crown and sword they were all wearing on their tunics. On her left, the short hickory-colored hair of another man blew gently as he prayed. Her heart leapt slightly when his blue eyes fell on her and smiled. Farrah Ironstone is played by Nikki Richardson from the Top of the Round podcast. Zorin, played by Cody Miller. Lord Pallas is played by Ian Wilkinson. The Sword is played by Haley Munoz. The Heartstone is played by Lainey Flanagan. Erilyn, voiced by Jordan Thompson. Thoughtmere, played by Benjamin Corley. Erebus Shieldheart is played by Jesse Phillips. Warahana Shieldheart is played by Laura Jurdak. Scott Mears' father, Lord of the Garnet Mountains, is voiced by Matthew Bianchi. Zane Shieldheart, played by Storm S. Cone. Cordelia Shieldheart is played by Jolene Frescus. Benedict Shieldheart, played by Brian Dowling. Scott Mears is played by Colton Jansen. Jade is voiced by Cara Danvers. This is Vix the Chaotic You, Sniveling Fools. Voiced by Daniel Nichols of the Happy Go Lucky Podcast. And I am Mike Ashley, your narrator. Please support our magnificent cast by visiting their projects in the show notes and telling a friend. This episode of Dice Tower Theater's Dawn of Dragons is brought to you by our patrons, Haley Munoz, Corey Fouch, and Daniel Nichols. You too can join our Patreon program for exclusive art, video, and discussion about the show 
even possibly joining in on a game. A detailed link is in the show notes or at Dice Tower Theater, that's spelled R-E dot com. Also sponsored in part by Brave Adventurers, creators of printable paper miniatures, free online generators, and more to enhance your tabletop game. In May, their patrons get a set of eight paper mini bandits and Kenku by Neil Q, plus eight classic dungeon monsters delivered through DM's Guild, including a Beholder, Mind Flayer, and more. Be sure to check out their free grimoire generator for titles and descriptions you can bring to your table. And also stick close as we're working on something very exciting together to be announced in the next few months. Can the adventurers find out what lies behind this mysterious and vast underworld? Will they be able to help the city and possibly find a way to return to the world they once knew? And who is Dode and the man behind the glowing blue eyes? Tune in June 7th for our next episode. And remember the oath. Hey there, I'm Tara. And I'm Jessica. And together we co-host the podcast Three Spooked Girls. If you love the paranormal. Or murder. Join us on Mondays for full-length episodes where we discuss our favorite paranormal stories and true crime cases. And join us again on Thursdays for our mini-sodes called Stabby Snippets, where we tell you all about true crimes happening in the news. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, or wherever the hell else you listen to your pods at. You can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook by using the handle at 3 Girls. Come and hang out with us and get your spooky on while we scare the hell out of you. Cassandra? Cassandra Cole? Welcome, both of you. You are the final two to arrive. I won't be gone long, and Aunt Nani needs your help. Promise me you'll be helpful. Hello? Is anyone there? <laughs> Screechers? The family reputation is at stake, son. The visual arts may lack relevance. Wait. What is that? Governor's School for the Arts at Walnut Grove. The Happy Go Lucky Podcast, producers of Charlie Saves Christmas, bring you our next heartwarming adventure, Cassie and the Spectral Shade. Don't you remember what it was like to be 17? It turns out you're quite pretty, and it wouldn't hurt for people to see me walking in with you. Good for you, Judy. Cut, cut. That was ghastly. Dreadful. I want you to go through it again. This time make me feel something. You'd think that if I could dream the same thing over and over, that eventually I'd figure out how to control it better than this. I'm seeing every moment, keeping them like diamonds locked away with you. Sorry about that, but you'll find that Walgrove has a thing for dreadful terms. Fair and warm, lone traveler. Come, rest that I your wounds may bind. If my reputation is based on the company I keep, I suppose I'm better off heading in on my own. Please join your fellow first years in the Great Hall, where the staff and faculty have prepared a lovely reception for you. You can call me Cassie. Cassie Cole. Sorry I didn't mention it earlier.